Welcome to Mayo Medical Laboratory's Hot Topics. These presentations provide short discussion of current topics and may be helpful to you in your practice. Our speaker for this program is Dr. Glenn Roberts, a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology and microbiology, as well as a consultant in the Division of Clinical Microbiology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Roberts provides a four-part introduction to clinical mycology, including culture and identification of organisms encountered in the clinical practice. This is part one in the series. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Thank you, Sharon, for that introduction. I have nothing to disclose. Introduction to clinical mycology. This is the first in a series of four presentations on clinical mycology. Today is part one, discusses what the clinical laboratory does to make the diagnosis of a fungal infection. Discusses the classification of fungal infections and the fungi related to them. And it also discusses the general features of the fungi, their importance, and the basic morphologic features of the moles. I think we periodically need to think of why we're working in the field that we're in, and that is to support patient care. And uh, there are a lot of activities go on behind the scenes that we're not aware of for the most part. And one is that a patient with some symptoms of something, whether it's a fungal infection or something else, and for our purposes, we'll say it's a fungal infection, come in with signs and symptoms of infection. The clinician has to decide what he or she suspects might be the problem, ask pertinent questions like a history of travel, and then investigate the immune status of the person because fungal infections uh, take advantage of people who are immunosuppressed. They then have to decide if they're going to culture uh, something and they select appropriate specimen for that. They have to uh, order a direct microscopic examination if they think it's appropriate so that we can make a rapid diagnosis in some instances. And then sometimes it even goes a lot further than that where they involve invasive procedures like bronchoscopy or, or fine needle biopsy or something like that. And other things that can be done are serologic tests for antigen, antibody, and some metabolites of some of these fungi that assist in making a diagnosis uh, prior to maybe uh, doing an invasive procedure. If a culture is ordered and something grows, they will perhaps order an antifungal susceptibility test. And then the laboratory sometimes is involved in interpretation of those results, whether it's a serologic test or whether it's uh, an antifungal susceptibility test. And then the most important thing, and we'll re-emphasize this again in just a moment, is communication with the physician. The laboratory must communicate with the physician and not be afraid to call the clinician up and give them results of patient care for the, about the patient result so that we don't delay therapy for these patients. And oftentimes we have to also go back and communicate with others in the laboratory to make sure we have all this information straight. Well, what is the laboratory involved with? Well, Oftentimes we're asked questions about collection of specimens by the clinician and we need to be aware of what those rules are. We need to uh, be proficient at the direct microscopic examination of specimens. We know about culturing. We identify lab the yeast and molds in the laboratory. We either uh, refer out or do antifungal susceptibility tests and fungal serologic testing. We're involved in reporting results, and again, here we are, we're communicating with physicians again, and this is a key part of what we do, is communication with our colleagues and with our physicians. Well, what are fungal infections? What are some general features? Well, first of all, these fungi may affect normal and immunocompromised patients. Many of them are chronic in duration. They last for years, like a ringworms and things like that, but in the immunocompromised patient, these can be acute infections and progress very quickly to death. They're not transmitted from patient to patient. They are not susceptible to the usual antibacterial agents that we know about. However, they are susceptible to several groups of uh, antifungal drugs called polyenes, azoles, and some others. And the therapy for treating fungal infections is not easy for the patient. Very difficult. The side effects are substantial and we need to make sure that we make an accurate diagnosis before these patients are placed on therapy. And again, these uh, infections may range from uh, being uh, just chronic type things to some that are acute, 
and progress to rapid death. And so we need to be thinking about a rapid reporting of results as we do our work. Well, we try to classify fungal infections into groupings, and it's hard to do because it's an artificial thing. But we divide them up into superficial infections, subcutaneous, systemic, and opportunistic infections. The superficial infections you can remember by just thinking about the fact that they involve the keratinized tissue, the hair, the skin, and the nails. And the dermatophytes are good examples of those and some others. Subcutaneous infections involve the skin and the contiguous uh, subcutaneous tissues. That includes the lymphatic vessels and most of the infections that are involved in subcutaneous tissue are acquired by trauma to a site, usually an extremity. Systemic infections can involve any organ system, and generally they're caused by certain groups of fungi that have specific geographic niche out in the environment, and they live in certain locales within the world, and we know where those are, and so we ask appropriate questions when the clinician does anyway, ask them appropriate questions. But these organisms that are involved in this actually can infect any organ system and actually do that. And the patients may be totally asymptomatic and unaware of this, or they may be very, uh, very ill if they happen to be immunocompromised. And then the last group is a very important one, opportunistic fungal infections. These are infections caused by fungi that normally don't cause disease in humans. They're environmental flora, and if we have a breakdown of our immune system, then we, and we happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, then we acquire these infections and they progress very quickly, particularly in transplant patients. And so we need to be aware of what organisms cause these infections. The hardest part of mycology is the terminology. It's the language. And I'm just going to go through very quickly here some of the names so you can see them. Of superficial infections, uh, dermatophytes involved uh, primarily causing these infections. Another, another organism that, however, that does cause infection and cause tenia vitricolor is called Malassezia furfur. The dermatophytes belong to three groups, trichophyton, microsporum, and epidermophyton. And these are just here to show you what the names look like. Subcutaneous infections, sportrichosis, mycetoma, chromoblastomycosis, and phaohyphomycosis are caused by sporthric schinkii, pseudalis cheriboide, Phylophora varicosa and Cladophylophora carioni, respectively. And you can see the names get a little complicated sometimes. They're not that hard once you learn them. In terms of systemic infections, histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, coccidioidomycosis, and paracoccidioidomycosis uh, are the infections that, that are grouped into this particular heading. And there actually is another one which is not listed here, and I'll mention it to you in a minute. The fungi that are involved in causing those infections, histoplasma capsulatum, blastomyces dermatitidis, coccidioides emetus, paracoccidioides brasiliensis, and one called penicillin marnephi that causes penicillosis in places like Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand. We don't see it in this country very often, but we, t we do see it. Opportunistic infections, uh, examples of candidiasis, cryptococcosis, aspergillosis, zygomycosis, and a whole lot more. The list could go on and on because we see organisms that we have never thought would cause disease, cause disease in patients here and cause substantial infection and the elephant has leads to death. Some of the organisms related to that, candida albicans, cryptococcus neoformans, aspergillus, rhizopus, mucor, and a number of other of the mucorales, fusarium, uh, acrimonium, trichosporon, and many others. Let's talk about the fungi in, in, in general here just a moment. They are eukaryotic cells. They have a cell wall. They have a, a cell membrane. And the cell wall is made up of polyanacetylcosamine. And the cell membrane contains ergosterol in contrast to mammalian cells, which contains cholesterol. And the reason for that, I'm mentioning this, is that there are certain of these antifungal agents that actually bind to the cell membrane that has ergosterol in it. They're heterotropic. They break down in organic matter to get energy sources for themselves, decaying matter. They're not susceptible, again, to the usual antimicrobials. They reproduce sexually or asexually. Most of the time in the laboratory, we see results of, of asexual reproduction with spores. They may be monomorphic, which means they have one form, a yeast or a mold form. They may be dimorphic, and that is that they have a yeast and a mold form or another type of form. 
And then some of them actually produce more than two or three forms, and they're called polymorphic. So reproduction by these is usually by asexual spores, and that's what we see all the time when we look at these organisms underneath the microscope. Examples of the fungi that, that you'll be familiar with are yeast and molds, which we'll talk about. Mushrooms, puffballs, shelf fungi, the morels, which I'm sure some of you have collected, plant pathogens and animal pathogens. And some of these are very substantial things that are involved in causing disease of plants and animals. One of the things that the fungi uh, are very, have a very important role in doing is keeping the carbon cycle going. They break down uh, organic matter and decompose it into carbon. They cause disease in trees, for example, like Dutch elm disease, which is a devastating thing for a, a population of trees, and they, they, we lose them all whenever they get Dutch elm. Crop diseases. Wheat, corn, barley, corn smut is one of those examples of that. And we actually have seen patients who have had disease caused by corn smut. Wooden timber degradation, if you look at wood, you'll see that there's some purple to blue material sometimes on there where the wood gets broken down by these fungi and it damages it. Another very important thing is these fungi can cause spoilage of food, particularly grain. And in developing countries where grain is a primary staple, the grain will get infected with a fungus and produce a toxin called aflatoxin if it happens to be infected with aspergillus and actually cause substantial disease in these patients and oftentimes liver cancer. And where would we be without the fungi in the brewing and baking industry? We'd be nowhere because the yeast are the things that cause fermentation. So they play a major role in that. Well, what are these fungi in general? We mentioned they're heterotrophic. They break down organic matter. They have chitin in the walls. They have ergosterol in the cell membrane. They have an organized nucleus. They reproduce by asexual spores, again, most often. And if it happened to be a mold, they produce hyphae, which you can see on this uh, left-hand photograph. They're nothing more than filaments that look like garden hoses underneath the microscope. And if it happens to be a yeast, they produce single cells that reproduce by budding. And oftentimes a few more structures in there. So just to give you an idea of some of the terms, some more language, if you will, to learn, we have terms that we use to help us describe what we see under the microscope to make it uh, a little easier for others to understand. Well, if you look at a mold on a culture plate, you'll see the colony there, a fluffy colony. And in our laboratory, we call them fuzzies. If you look underneath the microscope, you'll find out they're made up of these hyphae. These are filaments that have parallel walls. They look like small garden hoses. The collective name for the colony is mycelium, and I don't think many people use the term mycelium anymore, but it's there so for you to see. The hyphae, these garden hose type structures, may be divided up in compartments by some structures called septi. And so we talk about septate hyphae, and we talk about non-septate hyphae, which don't have any of these divisions, these compartments in them. And sometimes we just refer to non-septate hyphae as posse septate because certain of these fungi that are, that are thought to be non-septate have a few of these septations, and I'll show you shortly here. Spores. Uh, most of the fungi that we deal with produce spores that are called conidia, and they're produced on specialized structures, whether it's a short, long stalk, or a really uh, elaborate structure called a conidia fork. Some of the spores are small, some of them are large, and so we define them by being macroconidia or microconidia. And sometimes these spores or the hyphae may be pigmented or they may not be, and, and that leads us to different groups. Well, just some more terms here. The hyphae we talked about, these are the structures that make up the mold colony. The septi are the cross walls that break down the hyphae into compartments. Non-septate means that they're lacking septi, like we said a while ago. And hyaline is another term you haven't talked about yet, and that is that the hyphae may be non-pigmented. In other words, if you look at them underneath the microscope without any stain at all, they'll be clear. If you stain them with a dye like we do in the laboratory, lactophenol and on blue, you, you can see they'll turn blue with a, with a dye, but they still don't have any definable pigment to them. So they're called hyaline. And then we have other fungi that are dematiaceous, and these fungi are the ones that contain a dark pigment either kind of a chestnut brown pigment or very black. They belong to a whole different group of fungi, sometimes uh, some of which are very difficult to identify. 
And then there are a lot of structures that we have to deal with. And some of them are just nonspecific kind of things that don't tell you anything about the organism. And one of those is called a chlamydocanidium. It's a big round spore found right up within the hyphal strand or on the end of the hyphal strand. And its primary function is to protect the organism so that if it gets, becomes under adverse conditions, it'll round up and form these spores so they can survive. We see them nonspecifically in lots of organisms. And then the canidia. The canidia are those asexual spores you mentioned produced by moles that have septi. And the reason that I mention it with septi is that there are a whole group of fungi that do not produce asexual spores and have septate hyphae. They happen to have non-septate hyphae and the spores are produced in a different way. And we'll talk about that. This is a typical mole colony. Colonies are things that we see that we have to work from to make them out in the laboratory to be able to identify the organism. However, looking at a culture plate sometimes gives you a little information, but many times doesn't help you at all. The colonies can be multicolored. They can be white, off-white, brown, tan, green, yellow, pink, brown, black. They can be all sorts of colors. You may get a ballpark idea of what the organism is, but it's not going to tell you specifically what it is. This is another one uh, where you can see the colonies are smooth, adherent to the auger. And they have different morphologic forms when you start looking at these colonies. They look either very fluffy or very adherent to the auger and other appearances as well. So when you look at moles, you'll be surprised at the variety of things that you see. You have to kind of, you have to, with experience, you can tell sometimes which of the ones you think are going to be important. Now, this is an example of the hyphae. This is an electron micrograph where you can see these garden hose structures I told you about. And there is a septum the cross wall that divides that organism up and there'd be another septum probably down below it there and it allows that organism to be compartmentalized so that if it happens to be a break apart each compartment can then grow and start a new colony so it's a it's kind of a mode of survival for these organisms this is what it looks like under the microscope when you really look at it uh, you can see the septum there to the right of the arrow that divides it up and they're not usually so hard to see as this one, but sometimes they are. This is an organism that is dematiaceous. In other words, it's pigmented. And one of the things that you do in the laboratory is to recognize these moles sometimes by the, when you look at the way the spores are produced, you look at the spores to recognize the size and shape of the spores and so on. And you can look at this one and say, ah, I know what this is. This is bipolaris because of the features that you'll be familiar with as we go through the few other sessions. But the arrow here shows those septi. And you can see that this hyphal strand at the bottom left-hand corner is divided up into compartments. So that each one of those is a separate unit and can survive and grow and produce a new colony. And then the image here is one of non-septate hyphae. These are very large. They're not compartmentalized at all. And when the laboratory process is something that's suspected to have one of these organisms that has non-septate hyphae. If you grind it up like people do in the laboratory, that hyphal strand will pop open, all the cytoplasm will leak out, and it'll die. So what you have to do is be very careful. You end up having to not grind the culture up. You end up having to cut pieces of whatever it is, tissue or whatever it is, so that you can allow survival for this organism. But these hyphae are non-septate, and occasionally they will have septations, and we call them policy septate. This completes part one. The introduction to clinical mycology. Future presentations will be part two reviews of basic structures of molds and yeast, presents a brief introduction to the direct microscopic examination of clinical specimens, and also media that are useful for culture. Part three presents specific information on the culturing and incubation of cultures for the optimal recovery of fungi. And part four presents the methods for identification of fungi, primarily molds, and some helpful hints for working within the clinical laboratory.